Moon Knight's evil goddess, Amit, the Egyptian goddess that devours the dead, explained. Zack Snyder's Justice League takes a rather interesting approach in its portrayal of Superman's resurrection. When Superman dons his black suit and flies out to recharge his batteries, the pose he strikes reminds you of a certain son of God, and that isn't uncommon. Comic books are filled with gods from different pantheons in different eras. We're well aware of Thor's heroic excursions to Earth-616 and his parties with his Avengers pals too. Diana of Themyscira is a central part of DC's most iconic superhero team, but one pantheon that often gets overlooked and has only recently been shown some mainstream love is that of the ancient Egyptian. Egyptian mythology is fascinating because of how complex and macabre it is, and that's something we're all finding out thanks to Marvel's Disney Plus series Moon Knight. But while Khonshu has been depicted as a prick with a poet's heart, fans are much more interested in learning about the mysterious Amit, the mistress of the occult terrorist Arthur Harrow, who scares even the Idiot. What makes her so dangerous? Who is this mystical goddess? Or rather, what is she? We'll answer all those questions and more. This is Moon Knight's evil goddess Amit's origins, explained. Before we go on to our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, and let's begin. But first, is Amit a real Egyptian goddess? Real life origins explored. When Stephen Grant calls Amit the world's first boogeyman, he isn't wrong. In fact, that is the most accurate three-word description anyone can come up with for this cosmic beast. In ancient Egypt, the afterlife wasn't a simple case of partying it up in heaven or serving eternal damnation in hell. Death was an occasion. They had elaborate ceremonies to put their dead to rest. You must have heard about the obscene amounts of wealth those pharaohs loved carrying with them into the afterlife. But what exactly was it? And how does Amit fit into all of it? Let us explain. In Egyptian mythology, it was believed that after a person died and their bodies were embalmed and mummified, their souls descended to the Duat, aka the realm of the dead. Now we know what you're thinking. Here we go. The realm of the dead must be a place with bones for trees and mounds of heads for shrubbery and the hellfire and brimstone comprised of its atmosphere. But in reality, the weirdest part of the Duat was the fact that it had turquoise trees and lakes of fire, with only the latter even slightly qualifying as a feature of a religion's hell. Ancient Egyptians believed the afterlife to be a continued celebration of life itself, which is why pharaohs carried most of their worldly possessions to their literal grave. During the mummification process, most of the internal organs of a person are removed from their nasal passages, save one, the most important organ in a human being's body, the heart. So what happens when someone dies? Well, their hearts are weighed on a scale by the Egyptian god of death, Anubis. In a ritual appropriately called the weighing of the heart, the god of death measures a person's worthiness by comparing their heart's weight with that of the goddess of truth, Ma'at, who is often represented by an ostrich feather. It is believed that a person's heart records their deeds in life. If a person's heart weighs lighter than the feather of Ma'at, they are allowed to ascend to Aru the fabled field of reeds where Osiris holds court and an individual soul can finally find everlasting peace. If it weighs heavier, however, then they're denied the one thing that every Egyptian looked forward to in life and death, the continuation of their existence. Hearts outweighing Ma'at's feather implied the sinful nature of that person's existence, and such souls could not be allowed to exist beyond the time they'd already had. So these hearts are fed to the devourer of the dead, the goddess known as Amit. Technically, Amit is more of a spirit than a goddess because she has one purpose, to cleanse the evil from the Duat by making it her most recent meal. With the head of a crocodile, the body of a lion, and the hind of a hippopotamus, Amit's corporeal form was a combination of every man-eater known to Egyptians at the time which makes sense, honestly. Fun fact, a myth was so important to the cycle of the afterlife that people in ancient Egypt would put her mask on their doors to ward off evil. So to sum it all up, Amit is the minor funerary goddess who consumes the hearts and thereby souls of those judged unfit for a rule by Anubis via Ma'at. That was a mouthful and a half. Okay, on to what you came here for. Who is Moon Knight's Amit in Marvel Comics? If you were to read the story of Amit from Marvel Comics, you'd think she's more Cerebus than Hades. Unlike her depiction in the Moon Knight TV series, Amit, Amitu, or Amut debuted not in the pages of Khonshu's latest Avatar, but those of Marvel Comics' adaptation of Conan the Barbarian. She would go on to become a part of the Inhumans franchise for a bit, before her Marvel Universe origins were revealed in the first issue of the Mystic Arcana series. A myth used to be a sphinx in ancient Egypt, fond of asking riddles to human beings at precarious points in time. This was likely done to reconcile her appearance in Egyptian mythology with another prominent symbol similar to it. She was made from acacia petals mixed with Nile water, 
black sand and desert heat and transformed into her awesome bestial form by the goddess Ma'at's magical spells. For centuries she has served as the Watcher of the Throne of Bone and the Guardian Halls of Ma'at, hence the Cerberus parallel. In addition to this, Amit also carries out the duties assigned to her in actual Egyptian mythology. In the Marvel Universe, Amit is a devourer of the dead as well with the only difference in her portrayal being that she ate souls instead of hearts, probably because eating a heart is a gruesome experience for the person going through it and the person watching it happen. We've rewatched Season 1, Episode 6 from Game of Thrones enough times as it is. The other minor adjustment is that Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom, will record the events of the judgment before the sentences were carried out. This version of Amit is only involved in a couple of major storylines in the comics. She appeared to the mutant magic, when she was displaced through time and helped her recover the Sword of Bone as part of her quest. Her second major storyline would also involve the mystical artifact, but it would lean into her Sphinx origins as well. As part of Ian McNee's quest to restore balance to the magical realm, he was tasked with obtaining the Sword of Bone. As he was tracking his mark on a train bound to what he thought was a lead, he sensed a scent that just made his job a whole hell of a lot easier that of acacia flowers. Coming face to face with Amit's female form, McNee gives her an ostrich feather as a tribute and asks her the location of the Sword of Bone. Amit, being the mischievous riddle-spinning sphinx she is, agrees, but on one condition, Ian must answer a riddle of hers. The sorcerer challenges her to a straight-up fight, but she refuses saying that theirs must be a battle of intellect, and if McNee loses, all she'll devour is his mind. Luckily, Ian makes it out of that situation with his head intact, and with the Sword of Bones safely in his hand. The only time Amit and Moon Knight cross paths in the comic is in the second issue of Moon Knight Volume 8, where she allies with Khonshu in his latest mind game with Mark Spector as one of the mercenaries assigned tormentors. Besides this one instance, Amit and Moon Knight have no significant relationship, but all that is about to change thanks to the Disney Plus series. How Amit is different in the Moon Knight TV series than the comics or Egyptian mythology. In the Moon Knight TV series, the basic idea of Amit has been kept the same, but her premise has been extensively revised to fit the show's narrative, just like her disciples. See, while Mark Spector's costumed alter ego is a cult favorite among comic book readers, his continuity is about as linear as the Smiler roller coaster in Alton Towers Resort. The fact that the first meeting between Amit and Moon Knight takes place in the eighth volume of the character's plagued solo run should tell you all you need to know about how crazy things are for him. But hey, if Kevin Feige wants to shuffle around gods and goddesses from the Egyptian pantheon to make room for more cool, bird scold CGI animation, then we're not gonna stop him. A myth is introduced as a current patron deity of Arthur Harrow, crazy cult leader and the self-appointed Herald of Salvation. Harrow himself is a combination of a bunch of different Moon Knight characters on top of his own, like the Sun King, Morning Star, and the Shadow Knight, who was none other than Mark Spector's brother, Randall. Arthur Harrow used to be the avatar of Khonshu before Mark, but the overbearing moon god's constant demands broke his sanity and caused him to leave his master. Harrow realized that he had been going about things the wrong way, and if he were to truly fight crime and end all evil on earth, he would have to stop the bad people from doing bad things before they did it. No prizes for guessing who he decides can help him achieve his goal. Harrow decides to dedicate himself to unleashing Amit onto the world and finally administer the judgment it has long been avoided. In a neat yet disturbing homage to his comic book character, Arthur breaks glass and lines his slippers with it to remind himself of the sins he must repent for. In the comics, Harrow is a mad scientist whose pursuit of the depths of understanding pain inadvertently landed him on Moon Knight's radar. And he isn't the only person who received a backstory upgrade, because the MCU has effectively turned Amit into a deadly combination of herself, Anubis, and Ma'at. See, Amit isn't just the devourer of the dead in this TV series. She is the judge, jury, and executioner. Once a soul rests upon her scales, Amit can see their past, present, and future all at once, and pass judgment upon what their afterlife status is going to be. This is critical to the story, now that we've also been introduced to the MCU version of the Ennead. Unlike Khonshu, we haven't seen the physical form of any of the other Egyptian gods or goddesses yet. Even when Khonshu's reality warping shenanigans piss them off enough to call for a grand council, they don't appear themselves, instead operating through avatars on Earth. This takes place in the third episode, where Amit is practically exonerated by her defendant, Arthur, who was summoned to basically the god's version of a court trial. Under normal circumstances, incapacitating a domineering shady deity is something we would approve of, but after seeing what she is capable of and the paths she has chosen for the world, we cannot help but shudder at the thought of encountering her. What makes Amit so terrifying and mighty? 
The fact that her nickname is the Devourer of the Dead should give you enough of an idea as to how exactly terrifying Amit really is. In her original role, she was kind of like the Alioth of the Egyptian pantheon. Her job was to consume any soul that was unworthy of being allowed to cross over into the field of reeds called Aru. And it isn't like someone could just dox their way out of her either. Like we've mentioned above, Amit was the end of the line for Egyptians who were considered unworthy of having an afterlife. So for all intents and purposes, if she deems you evil, that's it. No magic resurrection, no accidental revivals due to temporal distortions. You will simply cease to exist because the journey down Amit's gullet is a one-way trip. The knowledge itself would terrify the bejesus out of a common man. And now add that to the fact that MCU Khonshu and Ennead actually trapped her in her prison themselves. And you start to see why the whole judge, jury, executioner deal might be a tad extremist. There's a line in the series where Arthur Harrow exalts the virtues of Amit being unleashed upon the world. He argues that had Amit been free, she would have prevented Hitler and the destruction he wrought. Nero, the Armenian Genocide, Pol Pot, all of these historically evil men could have been stopped way before they got their chance to traumatize entire generations of human beings if only Amit was allowed to administer her brand of justice. See millennia of passing judgment over mortal souls that seem to successive care lesser about morality itself Amit realized that her true purpose wasn't to pass judgment after the crime had been committed. It was to stop it from ever recurring in the first place. Her logic behind this conclusion is because that she can see a person's entire life, like a highlight reel, and instantly pinpoint their evil deeds. That eliminating them before they get the chance to carry them out is the best course of action for establishing a utopia. But like every deal that is too good to be true, there is a massive catch-22 here, and that is the fact that taking preemptive action against an objectively innocent person is something inherently unnatural. Amit has passed on her power to judge a person's deed and subsequently absorb their life force, if needed, to Arthur. And we see how terrifying it really is in the very first episode. In it, Harold condemns an elderly woman to death when the scales of Amit he has tattooed on his forearm decrees that she is the sinner to be purged from existence. The woman insists that she hasn't done anything wrong in her life, but Arthur just coolly informs her that her misdeeds could take place in a millennia later and it wouldn't matter because Amit's judgment is absolute and that is what should terrify us all. The definition of evil in this Egyptian goddess's book seems to be loose at best and she just happens to be a proponent for a planet-wide genocide of all the bad guys. The preemptive and decisive nature of Amit's sentencing is what makes her such a dangerous cosmic entity. The Ennead withdrew from the affairs of man for a reason. They realize humanity cannot be dictated and that mankind would have to pave its own path in its journey to becoming the masters of the universe. Amit's intervention would not only upset the social order, it would violate the sacred oath of the Egyptian pantheon and turn human beings into puppets bent to her fabricated idea of goodness. One would much rather be a denizen of Marvel's zombieverse, we think. Why Amit is one to watch out for. Kevin Feige is definitely playing the long game with this series. After the conclusion of the Infinity Saga, it looks like the next big plot in the MCU is going to be the Kang Multiversal War. But before we see Nathaniel Richards in his iconic armor, we're going to see most of the gods in the Marvel Cinematic Universe face their reckoning. Gore the God Butcher is coming in. Thor Love and Thunder and Doctor Strange 2 The Multiverse of Madness will be in theaters next month. One of the biggest rumor cameos is going to be the Vishanti, the three cosmic beings who give Strange his powers as Sorcerer Supreme. The creator of this order is the goddess Ashtar, who is also revered by the ancient Egyptians of the Marvel comic universe as the goddess of order Ma'at. That's right, a myth's patron goddess from the cosmics might debut in less than four weeks, and we're going to see her before that, definitely. What will be interesting is where they will go from here. The MCU is trying to establish its god lore in earnest, now that phase four is in full swing, and alongside Khonshu, a myth is going to be a central focus. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.